the name of Jesus Christ, good morning. Good morning. Please be seated. My name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors here at Central United Methodist. And on behalf of Pastor DeVern Schwinn and the rest of the staff, welcome to worship on this Reformation Sunday. This is the day that we remember our brother Martin Luther, all those years ago, nailed those 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church because he had had enough. And thus was born the Protestant Reformation. And without the Protestant Reformation, there would be no central United Methodist Church. So we tip our hats to Martin Luther this day. Want to uh, say a special word of welcome. We got a guest preacher with us this morning, Dr. Bruce Bloomer, and I will introduce him a little bit more in just a little bit. A couple of other things. There are a whole list of bulletin announcements there. Please take those home and read through those carefully. Lots of events coming up both today and later this week. So take those home and read through those. If you wouldn't mind, grab this red vinyl folder just inside the pews there. Take that, sign in, and pass that down. And then one last word that I wanted to lift up. If you didn't read my newspaper article a couple weeks ago, I want to take a moment to encourage you. We have a great opportunity for evangelism this week. It's called Halloween, where you have hundreds of kids who will come knocking on your very door. Take advantage of that opportunity. Let them know that the people of Central are radically hospitable, that you are welcoming, and that you are generous, so that they might, in fact, feel welcome here to be with us. You'll notice that the pews feel a little bit sparser now that we've added this third worship service. And now that we're done talking about money for October, now's the time to start inviting your friends to come to worship. We don't want to invite them before we do stewardship emphasis month. We want to do it after we're done with that. We have lots of space here to fill up, so don't assume your friends and family have a place to worship. They may not have been for months or even years. Invite them to come with you and take them out to lunch after. One other folks, one other folk, one other person that I want to acknowledge this morning. I want to say welcome back to Ryan. I'm glad to have you back home after boot camp. Great to have you here with us. Remember, read through those bulletins, pray for the life of your church, and let us stand and greet one another with the peace of Jesus Christ. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I am so glad to be here, and I'm extra glad that you're here to worship with us. Let's let's start this uh, next worship session with a prayer. Dear Father God, we come humbly today as the glad receivers of your mercy, your grace, your love, your unconditional love. There's absolutely nobody like you, and nobody close. Our desire is to worship you. Worship you in spirit and truth as King of Kings and as Lord of Lords. We thank you. We praise you for all you've done, who you are, what you're going to do. We acknowledge your presence in this place and in us as believers. In Jesus' name, amen. When you go, I'll go. When you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow.
This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. And we can plant that seed in many ways. We plant it in ourselves and we plant it into missions. Let's plant that seed of the word as much as possible. Please say the song with me. Let's do it twice. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put up my hope. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hand.
Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him and I am helped. The Lord is my strength and my Give them alertness and awareness to keep them safe while working with the machinery. Blanket them with your protection, and Lord, amaze them with your provision of yield. God, with another government crisis barely avoided behind us, and now with reports of eavesdropping on other national leaders, I ask, Lord, call us once again to return to you, our rock and our salvation. Help us to remember that neither our nation nor our government are the savior of this world, but you are. And so, Lord, we ask for your saving and healing grace in our lives. We are people who continually turn away from you, each of us doing what is right in our own minds. Help us to hear your still, small voice beckoning us towards a life of faith and hope and love. Lord God, we ask for your presence with all in this world whose lives are being turned upside down. For Syrian and African refugees who are separated from their loved ones and homeland, grant your abiding presence. For the people of Haiti who will not have a meal today, grant your mercy. For world leaders who continue to vie for pole position, grant your humility. For all of us who have sinned and strayed like lost sheep, grant your forgiveness. Just like a loving parent, God, we ask for your presence with our sisters and brothers right here at home in need of your gentle and abiding presence. We lift Jordan Vulcan up to your love. We ask for your spirit's anointing and healing for Rick Schwen and Peter Bogart, for all of our Jim Weber, for Denise Page and Art Jacobson, we lift Ken and Mavis Canals and Mary Worry to your love and light. Lord God, we lift Alice Winkles for your human touch. We also lift to your love our seminary students, Alyssa and Katie, and all who are studying to lead your people deeper into love and sanctifying grace. Lord, this month we also lift our faithful sisters and brothers across town at American Lutheran Church for your blessing and guidance. You have called our two denominations into full communion with one another. And so we ask your blessing upon them as they seek to make an impact for the kingdom of God right here in the Whetstone Valley. Bless Pastor Carl as he leads your faithful people and help us to work together for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us how to pray using the word sin. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. This morning we're blessed 
to have Arvid Levy, Levy share a few words about the status of the mission project and sending a container to Mutambara compound in Zimbabwe, Africa. Thanks for being with us this morning, Arvid. You've heard these last few months as we've talked about the uh, Mutambara project, you've seen the equipment that we've had here in front of the church for a couple of weeks. Uh, as we're gathering this together, we do have the equipment now that we need. Uh, we're just missing one piece, but for this trip, we have everything that we can get into the container. It's either been purchased or donated, and it's uh, prepared, ready to go. Uh, as we've been working on this, we've also, uh, at this point, it looks like we will have two teams of people that will go, six to eight people each, in February. And um, so things are coming together quite well. One of the things that we have uh, found is that lining up the transportation has been a challenge. Um, when you go to an undeveloped country, it's always a challenge to find people that can handle the equipment and do what we need to do. But the way it looks right now is the container will be picked up here. It will be shipped by truck to Minneapolis, where it will be on a train then to the coast. Then it will go on a ship to Mozambique. From Mozambique then it will either be by rail or by truck to Mutari, which is about an hour from the compound. At that point it will clear customs, uh, they'll, uh, we'll have to pay the tax, etc. And then it will be trucked into Mutupar compound. Uh, it's taken a long time to work out all those details, but uh, we finally have them in place. Uh, the one thing that's happened is that as we've done all of this, we knew we had the cost of purchasing the container, uh, the shipping, and also we have duty to pay on the used equipment, 15% duty. Uh, I asked them what they're going to base it on, and they said they will probably use what we paid for it or what the value would be here. So it looks like we've got most of the details worked out. The total cost for this project, as far as the purchase of the container, the shipping, uh, and the duty, is going to be about $25,000. Of that $25,000, we have $13,000 on hand to use towards that, which leaves us a deficit of $12,000. One thing they told us is that we'll have to prepay. So before the container will leave in mid-November, we're going to need this $12,000, and that's why I'm here today. Just to ask for your help. Uh, we have um, some envelopes that the ushers have that are designated specifically for the Zimbabwe project, or you can use your regular envelope and just mark it uh, for Zimbabwe. And whatever you can do to help us in this project, we would really appreciate it. Uh, it's an exciting project. Uh, people are excited both on this end that are going to do the work as well as the people that are there. And uh, I think it's just going to be a, a wonderful project. But, do what you can do to help us with it so we can get this container on its way. Thank you very much. Thanks, Arvid. And thanks for leading the, the charge on this mission project. As you heard, there's about a dozen folks that are going to make the trip, which is phenomenal. And not all of us are able to make the trip over to Mutambara this time, but we all have the opportunity to be able to be a part of that by our giving. So I want to encourage you um, to give generously to this great project. With that said, I'd like to invite our little ones to come forward at this time. Will you sing with me? This, this is where children belong. Welcome as part of the worshiping throng. Water gods were bread and cup, prayer and song. This is where children belong. Excellent. Good morning. How many of you guys are coming on Wednesday nights regularly? Raise your hands. Are you having a good time? You don't have a choice. <laughs> you know, my kids don't have a choice either, but you know what they say every Tuesday? Yes, tomorrow's Wednesday, we get to go to church. Never in my life did I imagine as a dad I would get to hear my kids say those words, and I am so thrilled. We have amazing leaders on Wednesday nights, don't we? One of the things that we've been learning, for those of you who haven't been with us, is all the books of the New Testament. Did you know you were learning this already? We've been learning this song every week. Can you repeat after me? I'm going to break the first one down because it's kind of long. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Big kids behind me. You guys can help me here. 
Repeat after me. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1, 2 Thessalonians, to Timothy, and a Titus. 1, 2 Thessalonians, to Timothy, and a Titus. What's the next one? Philemon and Hebrews and James and Peter, 1 and 2. Philemon and Hebrews and James and Peter, 1 and 2. 3 for John, 1 for Jude, and Revelation ends it, dude. 3 for John, 1 for Jude, and Revelation ends We've been getting together, we've been learning scripture, we've been learning the order of the New Testament, but this Wednesday we're going to do something special. We're going to take a little break from what we've been doing every Wednesday, and we are going to have a party. We are going to have fun. What happens this week on Thursday? What's the holiday? Halloween. So we want you to bring your costume. Don't wear anything yucky or gory. We want to celebrate God and God's love and not some of that other junk that comes along with it. So bring a fun costume and bring friends. Tell your friends to come because it's going to be fun. The middle school and high school youth are going to be leading some different games and activities and it is going to be a blast. So will you guys come and join me on Wednesday night? I'll wear a costume too. Will you wear a costume? Okay. You're going to be a tractor? I can't wait to see that. <laughs> a quad tractor, no, not, no doubt. Okay, let's pray. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for Wednesdays and our leaders. Bless them as they've been a blessing to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'll see you Wednesday night for the party. <laughs> it is my pleasure and honor to introduce my good friend, Dr. Bruce Bloomer. I always want to say the Reverend Bruce Bloomer, but it's not quite there. Not, not quite. He's an excellent preacher. He's a good friend of mine when I served the church in Mitchell, South Dakota. Bruce is the director of the United Methodist Foundation of the Dakotas, or the Dakotas United Methodist Foundation, as they're known, which is the group that we have our endowment account invested with. And so he was here a few months ago giving us an update about where our, our funds were. And there also happened to be a mission commission meeting that day, and they asked him to come in because they knew that Bruce has a passion for the people of Haiti and has been down there more times than I can count because it's more than one hand, the number of times he's been down there. So I'm going to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Bruce Bloomer. This much for long, so this long. Uh, my wife has said I have one of those doctors that makes no money, so just so you know. Um, Andy and, and Kate have been very special friends for us, and, and uh, while we were sad to see them leave Mitchell, we're, we really know they're a blessing for you. Um, I do have a book in the back. Uh, what I tell people is it's a $15 donation to Haiti, and by the way, you get a book. And if you're interested in sitting in the back table, and we use those funds for work we do on this little island of Blanca. The scripture, the verse that I'm using this morning is Matthew 6, verses 1 through 8, and the, the version that will be on the screen will be just slightly different than my version. Beware of practicing your good deeds before others to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as hypocrites do and in the streets, so that they may be honored by others. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go in your inner room, Close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. 
And when you are praying, do not use the meaningless repetitions like the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. There are dates that if I say them to you, someone here will likely have a connection. If I say December 7th, 1941, raise your hand if that date means something to you. Most of you would probably say Pearl Harbor. Now, how about if I said November 22nd, 1963? Raise your hand if that's a significant date. Less hands, but that's the assassination of John F. Kennedy. How about September 11th, 2001? That ought to bring a few hands. Sure, the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center. Now, there's other dates that are more personal to us. Our own birth date, if us guys, if we could remember our anniversary, I'm sure that would be a significant date. Birth of our children, death of a lover, and all these wonderful and tragic events that trigger a memory that we remember, or trigger a date that we remember. Anyone recognize January 12, 2010? That's become one of those dates for me. It was the earthquake in Haiti. I was part of a medical team that was serving in Haiti January 12, 2010. Now, some of you know the, the whole story, but the quick version is we were about 50 miles from the epicenter of the earthquake. While we definitely felt it and had numerous aftershocks for days, there was relatively little damage and no loss of life where we were working. It made kind of an interesting time getting home, and our families actually bore most of the pain because we were not able to communicate with them for a couple days, and actually, we didn't even know what happened in Port Prince for a couple days. Well, on each of my six trips to Haiti, I've learned something new. On this particular trip, I learned about giving in prayer. Probably not what you're expecting me to say. I learned about giving in prayer. One of the days after the earthquake, my son and I were playing soccer with the kids. We were taking a break, and so we decided to hand out some caramels to the kids, and, and someone from inside the house called us in for supper. So I said to my son, manger, which means to eat. Well, one of the boys bit his caramel in half and offered it to me. Now, people in Baganov eat four to five times a week. And I was on my way to eat more than this kid would have in several days of meals, but he offered me half of what he had. That was a lesson in giving. Think about it for a moment. Why do you give? Whether it's to this church or to a charity or some, another person, why do you give? Well, the scripture today is going to challenge our notions about giving. And one of those ideas is sometimes I think, even not consciously, we may think that maybe we're buying a relationship with God. Are we calculating our reward? Are we thinking God of it as an accountant? So we give so much and we do so much and then we've obviously earned something from God. It's like that balance sheet. I do so much and then you, God, you owe me something. Now, if we view God this way like the Pharisees, we're seeing only in terms of the law. We do, we follow the law, and then, hey, God, you gotta pay, you gotta pay up. But God implores us to look at our giving as love. Think about a child or a grandchild or a spouse or a friend that you love deeply, deeply and selflessly. Now we would give that person all that we have, and never payback would enter our mind. Well, the scripture is talking, asking us to think about our Christian life in the same way that the idea of reward shouldn't enter our mind. Well, the scripture today talks about that sometimes we want to be honored or recognized or earn the admiration of others. But if we do that, it says that's all we'll ever get. As the scripture says, it's our payment in full. If our aim is to get those kinds of rewards in the world, we'll likely get them. But that's going to be our payment in full. But there are other rewards that, rewards that God gives. By loving God, seeking God, loving those around us, then we grow closer to God. And so we give out of love. And we move to a different kind of compensation. One interpreter talks about the reasons people give. And we're going to probably find ourselves, a piece of ourselves, in these descriptions. The first is out of a sense of duty. We may wish to give, but we see that it's kind of a kind of a thing that we can't escape. When we give out of a sense of duty, we tend to generously give of our of things, but we may not want to give of ourselves. Second motivation is prestige. A person that gives for prestige, they're not pleased if others don't know about their giving. If there isn't proper thanking or recognition, 
we may not want to give at all. Now, we give not to help others, but we give because we want to be acknowledged. Or maybe it's a sense of power that we can control a little bit what happens when we give. And the third motive is simply because we have to. That we give because there's a sense of need and a responsibility to help others. That there's an outflowing from our hearts and a need to respond. There's a book called Seven Faces of Philanthropy, and the authors research seven distinct reasons that people give. Now, we're not going to have time to go into all those categories, but the top reason that most people give is that it made good sense, business sense. Most of this category are somehow connected to their community, <laughs> and it made good sense to support their church or charity because it might enhance their business relationship. But isn't the scripture really challenging us not to give out of that grim and self-righteous sense of duty and not for our own standing with others and not just because it might bring us glory or personal recognition, really not only to improve our financial bottom line. Shouldn't our giving become more instinctive? It's so natural that our left hand doesn't know what our right hand is doing. It's an outpouring of the loving heart, giving like Jesus gave, out of love. So why is it so difficult for us to give? There's a, an interesting book called Passing the Offering Plate. And the author offers review how mass consumerism has dominated our Christian life. They talk about how many consume and spend messages we receive in a week versus how many save and give messages we receive. Think about all the TV commercials you saw this week. Think about all the TV ads or the ads in the newspaper. How many of them encourage you to save and then give? Not very many. Consumerism powerfully changes our perceptions and our decisions. It turns our focus away from all that we have. It turns our focus away from blessings and abundance to what we don't have and what we don't possess. And we become confused with what we really need. I like this phrase in the book. It says that mass consumerism has set up a system of permanent discontent. That we feel poor because we're always being compared to others. And we've become unhappy with what we have, and we've become permanently discontent. So household and consumers and want decisions come first, and satisfaction and ability and need decisions come way second distantly. So remember that boy with a caramel who was truly giving half of what he had and made a gift, an instinctive gift, out of love. Well, the first instruction of the scripture deals with the why of we give, and the next section talks about the how of, we give, of our giving. Matthew 6 says that giving is not to be noticed, we're not to call attention to ourselves, that our giving should be done in secret. So the scripture says, when you give to the poor, do not sound the trumpet, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. Well, it's likely that the trumpets didn't actually sound, probably it's a metaphor to say, are we calling attention to ourselves? Are we calling attention to our gifts? In a previous lifetime, I was a school principal. One year, a person stopped by to say that they wanted to give gifts, and they wanted to collect information about families, and that they were going to bring them a basket of Christmas toys and Christmas goodies. Well, I said, well, what kind of information did you want? Well, they were going to collect um, some family's income, um, so if there were any family issues, uh, information about the children, I said, well, what are you going to do with that information? Well, they were going to set up a committee, and that committee was going to go through all that information, and they were going to determine if that family was qualified to receive the toys in the basket, and then they wanted to personally deliver those to the family so they could see that family's reaction. You know, I told them that while I appreciated that they were trying to help people in need, I wasn't going to give them that kind of information especially for a committee to discuss. That I'd be willing to give their money or their gifts to a social service agency and for that agency to deliver to the families in need, but that this group would not be involved in the delivery. Well, they looked at me like I was the Grinch's mean cousin and they weren't very happy with my plan. Now, I can't read their hearts, and I, but I still wonder to this day whose need was being met there. I thought, how would I like my own family being discussed, my finances? my lot in life, my children. I hope their, their hearts were, I hope it was giving out of helping others. But the how of that gift seemed to me like sounding trumpets of recognition. We had continued our clinic after the earthquake, but it really wasn't clear how we were going to get home. 
All commercial flights have been canceled for the foreseeable future. As a team, we got together and we started discussing what we needed to do. And one of the things we talked about was conserving fuel for our generators and, and conserving the food. After the meeting, one of our interpreters, Dede, came to me and said that he would come and he would go to his home and bring us food if we needed any. Well, Dede lives in a home that's smaller than most of our living room with his wife and five kids. And Maganov receives most of its food from the main island, so from Port-au-Prince. And so the ability to provide food for his own family was shortly going to become in question. We had more food in our kitchen than his family would eat in two or three months. But he offered me a gift, a gift beyond measure, an instinctive gift of love. So when I think about the why and the how of giving, I think about a boy with a bite of karma and an offering of all of one hand in their bleak home. Well, the second thing I learned in Haiti is I learned about prayer. As the week bore on, again, our team was safe. We had clean water. We had enough food to eat. It just wasn't clear how we were going to get home. In many different places, there were people working for our safe return. But there were many more people who were praying for us. It's the first time in my life I can actually say I felt prayers. I don't know how to describe it other than there was this palpable sense that people were praying for us and praying for me. It changed the word power of prayer way more than just words. I experienced the touch of prayers. Now the Matthew text today is the lead up to the Lord's prayer. And it's that lead up that's really important. Now the Jewish people believed in prayer. In fact, their prayer, priority for prayer ranks higher than most other religions, but as strong as their habits were, there were some issues. Well, there were prayers that were prescribed for the Jews for everyone. There was first called the Shema. The Shema is three short passages of scripture that was to be recited every morning and then every evening. Secondly, there was 18 additional prayers that the Jews must recite three times a day, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. There were short prayers, but they were reminders of hope and repentance and praise. But it didn't stop with those two main sets. There was prayers for before and after a meal, in connection with fire and lightning, the new moon, rain, lakes, rivers, receiving good news, entering and leaving a city. Almost everything in a Jew's life had a prayer. So think about what might happen. Because they were so meticulously prescribed and so repetitious, you might see that even you know, if it became routine or they got kind of busy, then maybe those prayers would just trip off the tongue. But before we get too judgmental of our Jewish friends, what about the last time you said a table prayer? What about the last time you just said the Lord's Prayer this morning? Did we think about how thankful we were for our food, or did the words just fall out? Did we think about how the Lord's Prayer would change our behavior today, or was it just this nice collection of words? Well, with all those numbers of prayers that the Jews are to recite, it was likely that some of those were to be made in public. So Jesus was saying, don't do that for the wrong reasons. Don't make it an act for the world to see. Don't make it so long or so rote that you forget why you're even praying. Or is it really that we have no time or no routine for our prayers? Jesus laid down two simple rules for prayer. This, the first is that all true prayer is just an offering to God. It's no, it's no matter where it's done, in public or in private, it's just to be simply an offering to God. The second is to remember that God that we pray to is a God of love, who's ready to answer our prayers more than we are ready to pray. We have to come to the realization that it's sufficient to go to God, not bargaining or demanding, demanding but simply saying, Thy will be done to go to a God who has a desire to give. When I think back about the earthquake, it's sometimes hard for me to understand that there are also prayers for people for no fault of their own or for God's who are in the wrong place and they die. I don't believe that we have better, better prayers or better prayers or longer prayers. I, I really believe that God wants good and that even when bad happens, God simply promises to be with us in the midst of that chaos or that pain. In the book, A Wolf at Twilight, the author Kent Nurburn relates the life of an elder in a tribe from the Dakotas. And I, I love this quote from the elder. It says, you have to be praying all the time or you're just thinking about yourself. Shouldn't prayer become so part of our life that we're praying all the time? Not, not necessarily in the regimented way of the Jewish tradition, but shouldn't we just be offering breath prayers, simple prayers for those around us, those who were mentioned this morning, our churches, our world, 
So when someone comes to mind, just pray for them. Nothing big, nothing long, just a simple, earnest prayer. When I began my job at the foundation, I would send cards to families and people to say to them, I was praying for them. It hit me one day that if I said that, if I said I was praying for you, I'd made a covenant. That it was an awesome, powerful covenant. And I realized that I really had that responsibility then to pray for them or not say that I was praying for them. So now I keep a prayer list. And if I say I'm praying for you, you make it on the list. If I don't know a family as well, I'll write in my card, God be with you, or something like that. Because I'm more careful, because I know there's power in prayer. In his book, The Power of a Whisper, Bill Hybels challenges us to listen for the whisper of God. And in doing so, God is going to speak to us and through us. But it begins with prayer. He encourages us that we're going to receive promptings from God if we fervently and frequently ask God to improve our listening. That we need to be attentive to God. And that we can't hear unless we reduce that ambient noise in our lives. And we need to do that by carving out times of quiet in every day. And then we need to respond to where God is calling us. So I hope this day is a day that you're able to reflect on the why and the how of your giving. That the scripture lets us see or see anew that giving comes from an outflowing of love and a relationship with God. That we re develop a connection with God through and, and through others through prayer. That there's a mystery in prayer that we really don't yet understand. But we know that prayer can change our life and the lives of others. So be the boy who offers half of what you'll eat today. Be the man of what, who offers all that he had in his home. Touch someone with your prayers. October 27, 2013. Let this be the day that you'll remember. That day you took that first big step in a renewed and deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, I invite you to pray with me as the worship team takes their spots. Gracious and almighty God, we give you thanks for Bruce and the calling that you have upon his life to minister to and with the people of Laganoff, Haiti. Lord God, we ask for your blessing upon his continued efforts in the medical clinic there. And Lord God, we ask that you would speak a new word into our hearts, that everything we say of you might be an offering to you, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
forth from this place, strengthened by his blessing, seeking to be a blessing for the kingdom of God. Go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. Go forth in peace to love and serve your neighbor. Amen.